Hey everybody, welcome to the uh, week three pre-recorded lecture for Taiji and Qigong in our spring 2021 class. Um, today I want to actually talk a lot more about um, Taiji Chen, which is this uh, sister art of Qigong that we're going to start exploring a little bit more in depth. Um, and is also a very effective way for us to cultivate our energy, cultivate our qi. So last time we were together, we spoke a little bit about the idea of cultivation in general, the idea of gongfu, of uh, applying yourself for a long time and then reaping the benefits. And I asked everyone to reflect a little bit on, you know, where is some time in your own life where you've exhibited gongfu, where you've exhibited some sort of cultivation or discipline to bring something into um, existence, um, something that you've persevered at. And we heard uh, some great accounts from people about just different places where you've persevered and then accomplished something. Um, <clears throat> this is going to be core not just to our Taiji and Qigong class, but to your success as a TCM practitioner, because it definitely takes cultivation. Um, it takes dedication. It takes follow through and you have to keep working at it. So my hope is that by discussing cultivation around the topics of Qigong and Taiji, you can take the information there and then apply it to your TCM studies because um, it's a long road to hoe, right? It really is. And everything we can do to support ourselves and support each other through this is going to be really, really, really helpful. So there's a different things that we talked about that we could cultivate. And today we're going to switch to um, uh, talking specifically about like, if we're looking at Taiji and Qigong practices as health cultivation practices, how do we know when we're succeeding, right? Um, what are we, what are, where, what domains are we expecting to see change in? And this is not just for Taiji and Qigong practice, but this is something that uh, honestly, I work with my patients around um, and, uh, I'm hoping to see changes in their health in these domains as well. Last time we also contrasted some of the um, differences in orientation between a sort of modern Eurocentric post-industrial uh, mindset and that of more traditional um, mindsets and traditional uh, ways of wisdom. And it was very cogently um, brought up in the chat that you know it's really, really important that we don't think about these um, more traditional ways of, of cultivation, of exploring the world and explaining the world as things that happened in the past, although they certainly did, that they are cert all, also very much alive today. Um, unfortunately, a lot of these voices are in marginalized communities that have been um, uh, on the uh, receiving end of tremendous historical injustice, oppression um, by sort of modern, uh, modern, especially uh, European um, uh, uh, colonialism, we'll just call it. So on the one hand, this is very depressing because the impact in recent history, I mean, in the past several hundred years of, on, on these voices has been very, very real and very, very tragic. On the other hand, it means that we still do have living voices that are telling us about different ways that we can relate to each other and the world. And um, these are still alive today. So please, please, please don't think that this is something in the past, something quaint, but rather um, a very central voice onto how humanity can thrive and prosper over millennia, right? Over millennia, not just for a couple hundred years, um, but a way to live in greater balance with ourselves, each other, and the, and the environment. So I, I do thank um, uh, Nafi for bringing that up last time, because it's very, very relevant to our conversation. Right. Um, so health cultivation. What are we trying to do in, um, in TCM health cultivation? Um, really, we see it already at the bottom that how can we be profoundly normal in certain arenas, right? So we're not necessarily aiming for peak condition or peak health or anything like that. We're looking to be very, very, very profoundly normal. Um, and the domain that I tend to look, look at it as sort of the health dashboard, and this orients how I speak to my patients in clinic, is I get some information about how they're eating. And by eating, I mean the entire digestive process. So especially how's your appetite? What happens after you eat? How do you feel when you eat? Um, and then how do you eliminate, right? So what kinds of food you're eating, but also what does that do in your body once you've eaten? And this gives me as a clinician, very, very meaningful information that's not tied to necessarily lab reports or anything like that, but rather the sort of subjective process of inquiry that I do with the patient. So I definitely ask them about um, appetite first. And I, interestingly, I, I recommend folks do this. Um, 
don't jump right towards elimination with your patients. Start with something that everybody likes to do or most people like to do, which is eat. And we ask about appetite. Do you have good appetite? What kind of foods you eat? What happens after you eat? And then you progress kind of down the digestive tract. Do you feel bloating after you eat? Do you get acid reflux after you eat? Do you get any kind of abdominal pain or discomfort after eating? And then we get to sort of the elimination problems. As, as my um, professor, Steve Woodley, who still teaches occasionally at the academy, said in Chinese medicine, anything, anything, anything that comes out of the body, we are very interested in, right? Because it gives us information. And our medicine was made before lab tests and MRIs and invasive procedures. Um, so we rely on anything that comes out of the body, be it sweat, be it urine, be it feces, be it uh, menstrual fluid, anything that comes out of the body, we're very, very interested in because it gives, gives us information about what's going on inside. So when we say eating, we actually mean the entire digestive process, right? Um, sleeping is another area. So every person I talk to, I ask about sleep. So we talked about the fundamental importance of yin and yang in our health um, and about sort of the cyclical relationships we have with the external world. And one of these main cyclical relationships is sleeping and waking. This is how we as sentient beings um, fundamentally embrace our relationship to the yin and yang of time, right? So yang being daytime when we do things and yin being nighttime when we do less, right? And there is a spectrum of normal here within sleeping, but very, very important to sleeping is that people do sleep, they sleep regularly and you sleep on a schedule. And ideally it has some relationship to the rising and setting of the sun. Um, very broadly, that means that um, in more Northern climes or more Southern climes where days get longer and shorter, which we don't see in the tropics, um, your sleeping should also respirate a little bit where during the summer, you can get away with less sleep. During the winter, we want more sleep, right? This is us embracing these natural cycles and putting them into our own rhythm so that we're going with the current, with the Tao, with the flow of things, right? Um, uh, having an irregular sleep cycle is very detrimental to your health. This is, you know, we hear all sorts of complaints from people that have jet lag or I work in corporate settings often and often these people need to get up at 2 a.m. twice a week to take a meeting in Taiwan, right? And this just, it messes with their sleep cycle, right? Um, so uh, regularity of sleep is really important and sleeping when it's dark is really important. And there's always a discussion that comes up around night owls versus um, you know, morning larks. And we can have that discussion some other time. There is, there is a range of normal here, but our actual predisposition as people that evolved in relationship to the sun and the sun rising and setting, there is a predisposition for us to sleep when it's dark, right? So we can talk a little bit more about that um, in the future. We can also talk about how modern lifestyles that, that are, include a lot of um, artificial light disrupts our biology, right? Disrupts our orientation towards the big um, cycles of the sun rising and setting, right? Um, moving is another thing I ask every single patient that comes in. I ask, you know, um, what kind of movement do you do? How often do you do it? What kind of movements are okay? Are there any movements that create discomfort in your body? This gives me information about how they're engaging in space, right? And this is really important and obviously a main sort of struck, uh, main sort of um, focus of our time together here in Taiji and Qigong class. Then I ask about breathing and breathing here is more, um, breathing is important in and of itself. And if somebody reports shortness of breath or difficulties breathing or phlegm or something like that, then obviously that's very interesting to me, but also interesting to me is, uh, the relationship between uh, breath and stress. So we know that the stress response is something that um, uh, runs through most of us at various points. And when the stress response, response hits, we tend to have sh shorter, shallower breath that's more located and high in the chest as opposed to low in the body. And we do breathing exercises together to, to try to play with that and try to bring the breath deeper into the body. Um, Sometimes I don't ask questions about breathing, but I just observe a patient breathing and I see where is the breath in their body? Are they taking full breaths? Are they taking labored breaths? Are they taking breaths that are focused around the chest? And um, when I put the needles in, I'll then look at the patient as they're relaxing on the table or in the chair and I'll see if their breath starts to regulate. And we can often see it doing that. We can see the breath just dropping deeper into their body um, during an acupuncture treatment. Um, because acupuncture, one of the things it does do for um, many people as it triggers the relaxation response, which will naturally turn down that sympathetic nervous tone and turn up the um, a parasympathetic nervous tone, which kind of turns off fight or flight and turns on rest and digest, facilitates the body's own natural healing processes. So breathing is a big indicator of the stress response, right? And it's also a wonderful way. One of the things I really like about breath is that breath is right, um, it's right on this line between conscious and unconscious, right? So we breathe unconsciously most of the time, but it's something we can consciously do, right? We can consciously influence our breath just by saying, okay, let's all take a deep breath together. 
And then we can just let it go on automatic and not think about it for several hours or several days, right? So it's right on that line between conscious and unconscious, which is, means that it's a conscious way that we can impact our unconscious processes. Um, we have lots of processes that we don't have that unless we're some you know, highly skilled yogi. Like we can't just say, okay, I wanna sweat right now and sweat. Or, okay, peristalsis, let's go, let's digest. It just sort of happens unconsciously in the background. Or I want my heartbeat to slow up or, or uh, speed up or slow down, right? Um, some of us can do this if we practice a lot with our yoga or qigong or whatever, but most people don't have an impulse, um, uh, that kind of window into controlling these subconscious processes in our body and our biology. But um, we do see that uh, the breath is something we can all access, right? We can all access and we can access it fairly young. Like I do breathing exercises with my seven-year-old when he gets all upset about something, you know, we do a little bit of breathing together and it actually works. So um, breathing is another thing that we're looking at. Um, and the last one, and this one is one that we, we don't emphasize enough in uh, Chinese medicine school, um, but a healthy person is somebody who um, not only can eat and digest normally, sleep normally, move around normally, not at peak performance, but normally, breathe normally, but there's this idea that we should be able to relate normally, right? And we see that many paragons of health um, in sort of the modern media world, uh, they may be paragons of physical health, but their relationships are not so good, right? The way they relate to other people. And so the, the archetype of this would be the professional athlete that breaks all sorts of um, world records or performance records and everything, but treats the people around them very, very poorly, right? Um, there was a, a movie called, I think it was called 9,000 Needles, and it was about, um, uh, Actually, we'll bring that up later. It's an interesting documentary that we can talk about later. But um, in terms of relating, uh, we're not going to get deep into this right now, but there is this idea that the way that we relate to others is a reflection of our own health. And if we relate well to others, that's an indication that we're healthy. And you can't run a lab report on this, right? This isn't going to show up on your hemoglobin, um, your A1C, you know, you're not going to show up on your blood pressure numbers necessarily. Um, but if people aren't relating to others, there's something that's not moving in harmony because as humans, we are social animals and we are meant to be relating to each other in, in um, usually a harmonious fashion, right? usually a harmonious fashion. So these aims, um, this is our aims and this is also my, my basic, basic health dashboard. When I ask somebody about their health, these, this is the framework I use to open up the conversation. And I like it because it's very human. It's not about a number on a page. It's not um, super quantitative, you know, it's very qualitative, although there are quantitative things we can ask. How many hours do you sleep? Do you wake up feeling refreshed? You know, what do you eat every day? You know, how many times do you have a bowel movement every day? These, this quantitative information helps us, but the qualitative information is also very, very important for us to get an idea of what somebody's sort of TCM health dashboard looks like and where people are on the spectrum. And then we can use our expertise that we're developing together to help guide them so that these are more profoundly normal. Um, so my, one of my teachers was a gentleman named Liu Ming, um, who used to teach here in Oakland before he passed away a few years ago. And he was really about normal. He says that, you know, Chinese medicine's goal is to be normal. It's not to be exceptional. It's not to run a five minute mile. It's not to be able to do some sort of eating contest where you eat 5,000 hot dogs and three ghost peppers. Um, it's about being normal in these regards. And we have things that you can do for the high performance stuff, you know, but foundationally, we want to be really, really, really normal, and it's boring, and it's beautiful. So let's just focus on that as, as sort of orienting ourselves towards um, what our goals are as TCM providers. Um, because we'll get requests from people that come in and they say, and we actually, I usually hear this when I'm teaching in person, I hear this from first year students, they're like, what are the herbs that I can take that can keep me up all night so I can study? I'm like, well, that's not normal, right? You're breaking the sleeping normal, you're breaking the, probably the eating normal as well, right? Um, so we already have those things, you know, you can go out and get crystal meth or cocaine or, you know, Adderall or something and stay up all night and study. We don't need Chinese medicine for that. We don't need Chinese medicine to be abnormal. We could find stimulating herbs, you know, to give you to try to keep you up, but it's actually contrary to our orientation, you know, or I need TCM medication to, you know, help me, uh, you know, perform really well in this uh, competition I have coming up. Well, there's probably things that might be able to help you, but it's not the central focus of our medicine. Our medicine is really around making people profoundly normal, right? So let's shift our conversation a little bit to the other movement practice. We talked a little bit about Qigong uh, 
last week, uh, sort of the technical stuff, you know, we talked about how there's, it's a derivative of um, a long tradition of personal cultivation practices, right? Um, and now we're going to pivot to Taiji Chuan. So Taiji Chuan is sometimes just called Taiji or Tai Chi, Tai Chi. And the Chen here means fist, right? The Chen, sometimes spelled Q-U-A-N, sometimes spelled C-H-U-A-N, depending on which romanization um, scheme we use. Um, but Tai Chi Chuan is sometimes called Tai Chi, but it really means, the Chen means fist. And by fist, that means martial art, right? So anything with palm or fist in it, it's a shorthand for martial art, right? or foot, there's some that say foot, but uh, mostly fist and palm are the ones that we hear. Um, so Taiji Chuan means the supreme ultimate fist and supreme ultimate is a translation of Taiji, right? And Taiji is this, it's a principle, right? It's a principle. And, and in fact, it's a central organizing principle of all traditional Eastern cosmologies. And the Taiji is actually the symbol that we see on the left-hand side of the slide, a yin and yang together, um, uh, you know, one black, one white, and each containing its opposites. And it's, we're meant to understand that these two fishes are constantly circulating and intertransforming, right? So it's a static picture of a dynamic process. So it doesn't matter if the black is on top or the white is on top or they're side by side because they're constantly moving, right? And this is our principle. This is this picture, which I for years thought was called the yin yang symbol, but it's actually called the taiji symbol. This is the taiji. This is considered the supreme ultimate symbol. And we can translate that supreme ultimate a bunch of different ways. The Tai means something great, something high, something cosmic. And the Ji is a unifying principle or a ridge pole, something that we can orient around to explain many, many different things. Fundamentally, when we approach um, our traditional East Asian uh, wisdom uh, traditions, we want to Think about this Taiji, this yin-yang contrast as central to how we're going to explain anything and what, what we return to as a unifying principle to bring everything into focus. And we talked about heaven and earth last time or the sky and the earth last time and how this is a, a central organizing pr principle of how we relate to space, right? And we talked about uh, light and dark as, a, as another Taiji um, contrast that we've worked with to, to talk about how we orient in time, you know, day and night, you know, winter and summer, right? So when we look at Taiji Chen, we see that it actually means the martial practice that uses this Taiji principle as a central organizing tenet. The main way that we think about um, the martial movements is in terms of this Taiji principle, in terms of yin and yang. And we have other examples of other martial arts in China that have come out. There's one called Ba Gua Zhang, which is the eight trigram palm, which says, yes, instead of thinking about the Taiji principle, we're going to use this eight trigrams as our central organizing principle. And there's another martial art called Xin Chen, which uses the five phases as its central organizing principle. There's another one called Nine Palaces Ba Gua, which uses these nine palace diagram that we won't get into now as a central organizing principle. So what Taiji Chen really means is we're going to be doing something that's rooted in the martial arts, that's the Chen, the fist, that thinks about yin and yang, this contrast of yin and yang as the main way that we're going to understand what we're doing, right? So um, we won't be practicing this as a martial art, and we will often hear this taiji, just called taiji, um, instead of taiji chen, um, which it's the same thing, and we're just shortening it. Um, if I say let's practice taiji together, I mean taiji chen. Um, and I don't necessarily mean the martial practice, although that's how I came to it. Um, I mean the movement practice derived from this martial art, which is actually way, a way more common way to encounter this and people practicing it as a health cultivation practice, as opposed to a martial art where you're actually hitting each other, sparring or hoping to compete or defend yourself with it, although it can be used. So um, let's contrast these two arts just a little bit. Um, they're very similar, right? And the first thing I wanted to, to refresh our memories on is that um, Qigong is a, is a broad term, right? It's a relatively modern term. People started calling these movement practices Qigong probably in the, around the 1950s, um, although intermittently maybe throughout history as well. But we, we situated it in the sort of greater tradition of Yangshan health cultivation, process, uh, uh, health cultivation practices that included uh, Neigong, which means internal work, or Daoyun, which means stretching and pulling. Um, all of these different terms throughout history have been used, and now we're calling it Qigong. Um, but basically, we're talking about exercises that are uh, oriented around primarily health cultivation. But there may be, you know, sometimes people use Qigong to cultivate other things like um, uh, power over other people um, or uh, 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 intuition or psychic insight. There's a bunch of reasons why people might be cultivating Qigong. We're, we're focusing on the health, the phys more physical health um, aspect of these practices. Um, 
it's a very, very broad group of practices and it's very historically complex. It didn't sort of come from one place, it came from many places and it's just kind of seeped into the culture all over the place. Um, uh, we can find Qigong practices that are very diverse and sometimes I compare it to um, back in the 70s when uh, these uh, yoga practices were, were coming over from Asia for the first time. If you went to a yoga class, we didn't, it could have been a whole bunch of different things, right? It might've been meditation and visualization. It might have been um, hygiene practices where you're putting like soapy cords up your nose and out your mouth to cleanse out your sinuses. Like this was all sort of yoga back then. And now fast forward, whatever, 40, 50 years and we're at a place where if, if you see something that says yoga and you go to a yoga class, you're probably gonna be doing like up dog, down dog and warrior one, warrior two. There's, it's sort of consolidated and becomes sort of this consumer um, uh, version of the very complex and diverse yoga practices that existed historically in the Indian subcontinent, right? So um, Qigong is sort of in a similar place to where yoga was in terms of it being partially co-opted and commercialized, not, not all bad, but um, you know, simplified by the modern market pressures that these movement arts hit. So right, right now Qigong can still mean a lot of things. And sometimes we see Qigong as being almost more like a group prayer um, kind of thing where people are focusing their healing and um, intentions and energy and sending it out to somebody. Um, or we could find Qigong that's based around martial practices where somebody's getting you know, kicked in the genitals over and over and showing that it doesn't hurt because their Qigong is so good. Um, we're, we're not gonna be doing that, right? We're, we're, we're gonna be doing um, uh, practices that are really much more uh, around basic health cultivation, not these sort of more um, esoteric practices that might be, might be also called, by, called Qigong by certain people, right? Um, so Qigong, suffice it to say, is, is uh, it's a very broad group of practices. It's very historically complex complex, um, but we do often see that there's repetitive forms in modern Qigong. So many of the Qigong forms that we do, you'll do 10 or 20 of this exercise, and you do 10 or 20 of this exercise, and you do 10 or 20 of this exercise, and after doing five to 10 movements, you've done your Qigong set and you're done, right? Um, we contrast this to Tai Chi Chuan. Tai Chi Chuan um, is rooted in martial practice, so um, it actually, we can very firmly say that the, that the Tai Chi forms that we do today were derived to protect yourself and beat other people up. Like this is this is why people did them, right? It was rooted in the martial arts. It came out of a, a time where martial arts were still um, co commonly practiced uh, by many people and were actually, you know, uh, something some people needed to do to protect themselves, or their family, or their business, right? Um, before firearms and this kind of stuff, martial arts were what people did, right? It has a more recent history. Um, there's a legendary history to it as well. And I'm not gonna get into the origins right now. I'm actually gonna leave that off as a homework assignment for you. Um, but uh, it has a 17th century origin in Chen village, which is a, a geographical location that exists today in China. Um, uh, because it's a martial art, there's more partner practices. So we have two person Qigong, Taiji forms rather, and you can find these in Qigong, it's just not nearly as common. Um, and there's a more external orientation. So with a martial practice, it becomes not just like, what's my enteroreceptive capacity? How does my body feel? That's important. And we see that in Qigong as being very important. But in Taiji, what's going on in the outside world? If I'm looking to defend myself, I need to have a, uh, an orientation in space that helps me with that. So an awareness of the space around me, an awareness of the chi around me, um, what's going on outside of me, because that's where martial arts operates, right? There's something outside of me trying to hurt me, so I need to orient to that. Last week, we did our very first um, posture, which was play late, and we found that the first thing that we do is we put up our hands, we put up our dukes. Sorry, I have a, a dog. Um, okay, hoping that we don't get too much more barking, but who's to say? All right, um, so we have this idea that Taiji Chen um, uh, is gonna have a more external orientation, although it is very much an internal orientation as well. How does your body feel? And um, I'll take this opportunity to, to say that Taiji Chen is a, is a member of a group of martial arts that are meant to have this shared external internal orientation that's called Nei Jia Chen, which means the, the internal family of martial arts. And, and historically, these are just described as Taiji Chen, Xingyi Chen, and Bagua Zhang. Um, and people will contrast this to the more external martial arts like Shaolin Gong Fu or Karate or something like that, where your own internal perceptions are not as important, right? It's much more about what you do on the outside. And it's kind of a rabbit hole of discussion that we're not gonna get into, but I just wanted to kind of prime the pump and let you guys know that that's out there, this family of internal martial arts that Taiji Chen is part of. 
Um, we also find when we get to the actual practice of Taiji, uh, there are some things that you can do repetitively, some drill work and certain uh, foundational exercises that you can do repetitively, and we'll do some of those together. But traditionally, it's the, the practice is a, a long form practice, which is a series of movements, a series of, of choreographed movements that put together in a sequence combine the fundamental solo practice, where you'll get up and in the, in the morning or in the evening, whenever you have time to practice, you will do this long series of movements together in a string. And this series of movements, this form is thought of as sort of an energetic equation that comprehensively moves the entire body and connects all the extremities internally to the center and then connects the center to all the directions externally. So it's very complete, right? Um, we just contrast this to the Qigong, which is often like, okay, we're gonna do this exercise 10 times and then we'll do this exercise 10 times. Um, the Taiji long form practice is you do this one exercise once and maybe it lasts 20 minutes, maybe it lasts, you know, 40 minutes, depending on how fast you do it, but it, it goes on for a while. Um, we won't have the time together to actually get into a long form practice. We'll do part of a short form together. Um, but generally, even though there is repetition within the Taiji long form, um, it's not nearly as repetitive as uh, your standard Qigong practice. Um, if we look at how they're similar, we see right away that the movement quality is typically very similar. And you know, we've already been emphasizing this quality of smooth, un uninterrupted motion linked with the breathing, right? So we find this in Qigong, we find this in Tai Chi Chen. This isn't an absolute rule. There are um, Qigongs out there that um, do not have the smooth movement quality that have more of a shaky, vibrating kind of movement quality or a sharp exhalation of breath or retention of breath. We're not looking at those right now. Um, the Qigong that we'll be doing together is much more sort of water method where um, things flow smoothly. And this is very resonant with our Taiji orientation. Right? Um, we see that there's health benefits associated with both of these. And you know the, the research on this is pretty unequivocal and it's pretty powerful um, that doing Qigong and doing Taiji Chuan improves circulation, improves balance. Um, it, it improves proprioception and spatial awareness. It reduces stress and it has a meditative quality as well. So it cools off the mind, cools off the spirit, right? Both of these, and especially the way we practice them um, these days have very similar health benefits, right? Um, and we find that often uh, when we practice, uh, we're practicing together. So there's this idea that we, if we do our Taiji formwork alone, that's good. If we do our Qigong formwork alone, that's good. But there's something about practicing together uh, and moving together, which adds an additional layer of benefit, right? And this is sort of our resonance theory, right? Our resonance theory um, that doing, th that we are naturally resonant beings, that we naturally exchange, uh, exchange energy, exchange relationship with the environment and each other and doing something together promotes harmony, right? And here's a link, I wonder if this link will work. Let's see if it works. So if I click on this, it links to a YouTube uh, that shows us just a brief video of, a whole bunch of metronomes, and we're not going to look at the whole video together, but I recommend you do because it's kind of fascinating. Where um, we see somebody starting off a bunch of metronomes, and I'm going to fast forward through here, and then we see they're all moving differently. But after a while, we see, oh my goodness, they're all moving together, right? So there's this idea that moving together builds a certain kind of harmony. And obviously, we're not metronomes, but we are. Um, animate energetic constructs that have a vibration together, right? Which is what we're seeing with these metronomes. So you guys can look at that video a little bit more extensively on your own if you like. Um, so we have this, uh, we have this uh, Qigong and Taiji similarities, similar quality of movement, similar health benefits, and a similar idea that if we do this together, it benefits our social body, right? It benefits our social body. So um, we can't do that right now physically, but there is a benefit to just even us doing it in our own little remote virtual environments together. So uh, uh, I'm glad we have that opportunity. And I hope we have the opportunity to do it in person sometime, right? Um, so when we start talking about, yes, when we start talking about um, Taiji Chen and Taiji theory, uh, one of the first things we need to do to embrace the flavor of Taiji is start to orient externally. So last time we talked about orient in internally, we held this Pengjing posture and kind of filled up and just kind of felt the presence of our own internal world expand to the borders of our body. 
with our Taiji practice, we're going to start taking this and expanding this into orientation and space, right? Um, this is kind of cosmologically important too. Um, when we talk about um, uh, traditional knowledge pathways, traditional wisdom tra uh, methods, everyone that I've encountered says that direction is important, where you are in space. And not only that, the directions have personalities, right? The directions have personalities. And there's not universal agreement about what the personalities of these different um, directions are across different cultures. And I'm gonna talk about specifically the East Asian orientation. We find um, a different set of associations in different traditions. And what we find is that they're internally consistent and they internally kind of cover similar domains, although they may um, differ about what each specific direction means and what sort of the totems of each direction are. Um, when we read that Ed Neal article last week, we also discussed how um, the way that we build an understanding in our traditional um, East Asian cosmology is through an associative model. And here we're starting to build this network of associations in our head by looking at this, right? So it's not key that we understand exactly why all these associations are here right now, right? But even by reviewing these, we're starting to build this network of relationships in our head that we operate within when we provide care for other people in Chinese medicine, right? So we'll, we'll talk about these briefly, and you're gonna learn more about this when you uh, kind of build out your five phase understanding, because this dovetails almost exactly with the five phases um, when we talk about four directions and center, right? Um, and it starts to open up a door of some of the associations that you're going to encounter later on in your education if you haven't already. Right? So we'll, we'll go through these together briefly. I'm not expecting everyone to absorb all this material and be able to recapitulate it, but for, for our purposes, I want everybody to know the directions and sort of the totem animals and their colors in each direction. Right. So we'll start out with the east. East is beginnings, east is a sunrise, east is also the spring. And we say that there's a, uh, a constellation that occupies the eastern part of the sky called the green dragon, right? And so green is this fresh spring energy um, associated with the rising sun, the phase of wood, which is this bright growing energy, which we're just starting to see in the Bay Area here. I mean, it's January, but the, the warm weather is already starting to kind of show us the growing of this young energy of the spring, right? Um, there's a couple organs, the liver and gallbladder, um, where we think about the East as a realm of renewal, of growing up from a root, right? And once again, the, the orientation here towards a, a symbol is this green dragon, like Qinglo, right? And it's green-blue, but we'll just call it green for now. Um, moving from the East, we go to the South. In the South, we say the, the totem animal is a red phoenix. Um, this is the path of the sun. This is, if you're growing up in the northern hemisphere the sun is relatively in the southern hemisphere because of the way the earth is oriented on its axis um, the phase here or the element here is fire the season is summer when the sun is brightest and stays out the longest and the or our organs are the heart and the small intestine also these two more mysterious organs called the pericardium and the sanjo um, it's considered the realm of splendor the realm of sort of um uh effulgence, right? Um, and this energy of flaming upward, right? So this is this is our south totem animal. Uh, in the west, where the sun sets, we consider this the realm of the white tiger, right? Um, so the element here is metal, the phase here is metal. This is a consolidating phase. The, the time of day is the setting sun. The time of year is uh, the fall when the natural world kind of draws in. It's also the time of the harvest where people use um, traditionally metal tools to separate what will be left to rot from what will carry through the winter, right? So it's a time of simplifying things. It's a time of condensing things. And metal element is thought of as very emblematic of this because the, the metal element is, you get it from the earth, but it's consolidated. It's something purified and refined from the earth, right? Um, this is associated with the lung, uh, and interestingly, this is one of the reasons that metal phase is also connected to air and breathing, right? Um, so our lungs job is to take this heavenly energy around us, this um, environment of air and oxygen that we exist in, and purify and take out just one part of it, which is this lung chi, this heavenly energy, and put it into our lungs, into our, into our blood. This is the job of the lung. 
and the large intestine on the other end is, is like, okay, what can we leave behind, right? What don't we need anymore? We've taken everything we can out of this food and whatever's left, we put back into the earth, right? Um, because this is the realm of the setting sun and the realm of the fall, it's also, um, it's also thought of the realm of the ghosts of the ancestors, sort of what has come before, right? What has come before? What, is, what are the resources that are out there that are no longer um, participating in the same way, but they're still kind of like, penetrating everything in, uh, you know, in some traditions, they call this the realm of sort of the underworld, where these influences that were animate in our world are now still present, but um, communicating via different means and animate living people talking to each other, right? And then energies of refining and contracting we, sp we spoke of. Um, in the north, we have a very, very interesting constellation here called Shenwu, the dark warrior. And uh, the original totem for this was a, a turtle with the head of a snake, which I've never seen, right? Um, and I think that's part of the, the, the idea of the North, is the North is this area that's um, dark and cold and mysterious, right? It's an area of the unknown. And traditionally in China, it was also the area where the um, non-Han Chinese people, uh, which you know, they referred to as barbarians, but it was basically nomadic herds people, would periodically come down into China and invade and plunder. Um, and, and sort of disturb the uh, agrarian life of the early, uh, later Chinese identified people. Um, and this relationship between these sort of unknown hordes of the North coming down and the response of the agrarian peoples from the center, from, the, from China, um, actually this dialogue of different traditions is one of the fundamental uh, structures of why Chinese culture evolved as it did. And we can get more into that later. Um, but the North is this darker realm, this colder realm. The color is identified as black and not just black, but described as Xuan, which means sort of dark and mysterious. And the, the best description I've, I've heard of this color is it's the color of looking into the ocean at night, right? So it's not just dark, but it's kind of deep and a little bit mysterious, right? Um, water has always been an element that inspires a little bit of trepidation in the East. Uh, you know, the, the, in early Chinese history, the, the rivers, the, the early Chinese settled on the banks of the river um, and the rivers would periodically flood. And this, they would bring this, uh, this soil from the mountains to make the land fertile, but they could also flood and kill your entire family and everybody. So um, water was always thought of as this capricious element that um, was scary, right? And unpredictable, but also vital, right? Season of the winter, direction north, um, the kidney and the urinary bladder are the two organs here, and the kidneys being thought of as the deepest reservoirs of your energy in the body. It's also thought of as the realm of pathogens, the realm of things that try to invade, right? So in the winter, we get sick more often, and the north and the cold in and of itself was thought of as this um, very pernicious idea. This, 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 this cold could creep into you, and we take this for granted living in Oakland, where it's like, oh, it's, you know, it's January, I'm gonna go out in a t-shirt later today. Um, if you live in a northern clime, if you don't have sufficient warmth, then the cold will kill you. It will kill you very quickly. And so this, this fight against cold is historically a very, very important fight. And um, not just through um, uh, adequate shelter and uh, fires to keep you warm, but through warming herbs, warming foods, warming therapies like moxibustion to try to keep this heat. And we say heat is life, right? Heat, the yang of heat is life. And, you know, we wait, we are 98 something degrees. When we die, we go back down to room temperature, right? So this heat, this animation is thought of as in contrast to the cold. So this is north versus south in our bodies or the heart versus the kidneys in our bodies, a balance of fire and water, right? The energy of water is descending and cooling, coming in and down. And we can just think about what ha happens to water when you pour it, it goes down. Right, whereas fire flares up. So again, these contrasts and directions. In the center, we have this figure of the yellow emperor, right? The yellow emperor, which is the, the legendary progenitor of Chinese medicine and Chinese civilization, right? The stabilizing presence that preserves tradition. Um, the element is the earth, right? The earth itself. So, um, and of course, in in uh, many parts of China, the earth is described as a yellow color. So by yellow, we think here of, of, of yellows and light browns, ochres, all these sort of earth tone colors. This is all yellow. It's not necessarily bright yellow like a balloon or something like that. It's more of an, an earthy yellow, an earth tone, an ochre, right? Um, interesting that here it's the only sort of uh, anthropomorphic um, totem, although 
in Chinese history, the, the, the black turtle also became anthropomorphized, anthropomorphized as Xuanwu, the dark warrior, and later as Jun was the righteous warrior. Um, the yellow emperor started out as a, a, a human figure and isn't always pictured as a totem. So on the bottom left, we see more traditional uh, totems here. You know, we see our, our turtle with a snake around it. We see our dragon, we see our tiger, and we see our phoenix. Um, the phoenix here, I should mention, sorry, going back, is not the phoenix of Egyptian mythology of this um, bird that flames up and re is reborn, but rather um, one of my instructors described it as sort of like a large magical turkey. <laughs> it's this emblem of good fortune, of things going the right way. Um, and, but it doesn't have this kind of uh, uh, cathartic idea that we have in, in, uh, in, in many times in the West derived from Egyptian mythology of this, of this uh, bird that flares up and burns itself out and leaves, uh, leaves either jewels or an egg for renewal behind, right? So the, the phoenix is a little bit different. It's more like a big, big red turkey, right? Um, going back to Earth, we have this yellow emperor figure in the middle representing Earth stability, continuity. Um, it's also the realm of tradition, things that are handed down by humans to each other for a long period of time, stability, right? The season is this Indian summer. Um, and Indian summer, um, I put it in quotes, I'm not crazy about the phrase Indian summer for a number of reasons, which I don't need to get into. Um, we can say that this is the end of the hot summer, but really the, the, this, this, the summer of the earth phase is a small season in between all the other main seasons. And we can look at a diagram later that will show um, sort of each direction has a season, each phase has a season, but it's thought that as each season transitions to the next, the energy returns to the earth and touches it. And there's this transitional season. The most famous one being the sort of Indian summer that's in between you know, the, the, the hot, hot summer and then the cooler fall, we get a few days of sort of um, returning young energy where it feels warm again. Um, but we will notice that the, the actual Chinese calendar has this uh, uh, in between season between every major season. Um, and that, that's a subject of some study called the, the, the Qi nodes or the Jie Qi. Um, what is the actual energy of this season? We can break it down to 24 seasons and the ones in between the major seasons are these earth seasons, right? But we think about the center as being stabilizing, enduring, and we should bring up that, you know, the, the, the name for China in Chinese means central kingdom, Zhongguo, right? It means the, the one in the middle. Uh, and this is the, the center. And you know, in the center of Zhongguo was a yellow emperor. Huang, right, the yellow emperor, really consolidating the central energy. So this is our sort of symbolic associative uh, network of relationships that we participate in, um, in our Chinese medicine, in our Chinese cosmology. How does that impact our Taiji practice? Honestly, um, I brought this up to show that directions are important and the associations with the directions are important and our actual physical tai chi practice we actually don't need very many of these associations but we need to understand that direction is important and precise direction is important right and we're going to work on that together um, uh, next week when we get to hang out so basically the tai chi trend five directions are the four cardinal directions plus center um, so we have they have we have traditional names and the traditional names are not as important as the idea that we have five directions. We have the center where we start, and we have stepping forward, stepping back, stepping left, stepping right. right? And we want these to be fairly, fairly exact. In fact, kind of detailing this matrix of space around us is a very, very important way to start our Taiji practice. So, you know, our Taiji form starts out with a simple step forward. And when we step forward, we want to step actually forward. We don't want to step a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right. We want to be oriented together and move together in this sort of matrix of the, the compass rows. Right? Um, as we get a little bit deeper into our Taiji form, we'll find out that it's not just forward, back, left, and right, but it's also the corners. Right? So we have north, south, east, and west, but of course, we also have northwest, southwest, et cetera. Um, we don't need to touch that right now. Suffice it to say that it's like sort of uh, coming down the pipe, and we find that as um, the Chinese have historically done, um, when, whenever you have a number that resonates with something else, they're gonna make those associations. So we've got the five directions and the five phases, and then we have the eight directions, which is the four main directions plus the corners. And we're gonna associate that with the main symbol group associated with the letter eight, which is the ba gua, which we see here. These three lines that represent different mixed states of yin and yang. You certainly don't need to memorize any of this. Um, uh, what I really want is just that basic awareness that when we begin a Taiji form, 
where you're standing and where you're oriented is important. Um, in terms of concrete practice, I can tell you that I've um, practiced with a number of different um, uh, Taiji experts, and I haven't heard a consistent line about what direction you're supposed to face when you start. Um, and my personal experience is it depends where you're practicing, right? It depends where you're practicing. What's the, you need to kind of figure out where you're practicing and figure out what the best orientation is at that time, right? So, you know, in the morning, it might be nice to be facing the sunrise, maybe, but maybe, maybe that's too bright. Maybe when you're back to the sun, maybe you have a better view, you know? So we're certainly not gonna be dogmatic or doctrinaire here, but I do want people to um, realize that orienting yourself in space is very important. Um, and I also recommend that if you are practicing consistently in one space, practice facing the same direction each time, and that will help you. Um, you know, you may find it helpful that uh, to, to sort of, um, if you want to help your Taiji practice benefit your studies, maybe you find a place where you can find the cardinal directions and you put a little picture of these totems in each of these directions. So, or maybe you just put a color, you put red in the south, and, you know, white in the west, or a picture of a bird in the south and a turtle in the north. Maybe this helps you dial in a little bit, right? Um, I will also note, sorry, I forgot to note, note this on the last slide, that um, when we put up our compass traditionally in uh, sort of East Asia, we actually put south at the top, right? And north at the bottom, which is why when we look at this as first and we see south at the top, north at the bottom, east on the left and west on the right, it seems, it seems weird. I mean, I know that most of the maps that I look on put north at the top. Um, this is completely arbitrary, right? It's completely arbitrary. The reason that we put south at the top is that there's a saying that the emperor faces south. The emperor has his back to the north and is facing the south where the, the sun is rising. So the sun shines onto his face as, as he's governing or if he's an emperor, empress as she's governing. And there were a couple of key empresses in Chinese history, let it, lest we forget. Um, so that's important for us. And we're gonna see this over and over. Um, when we look at anatomy diagrams, we'll see things with a similar orientation and you know, south is up top and north is up on the bottom. And that corresponds with the heart being up top fire phase and north, the water phase being the kidneys being lower down, right? Uh, so this is the, our main focus now. We have our four directions plus center, uh, giving us five directions. Um, we're gonna be doing stepping patterns together when we next meet on Thursday. Um, I would love it if you all would start to review some of the orientation on this slide, which I'll share in the, in the, in the Neo LMS and start to kind of um, build that associative network of directions and organs and colors and things like that. Um, you're gonna to have to learn it sooner or later anyway, if you haven't learned it already, but this is the beginning of us forming our associations and participating, participating in that, cosmology where these principles are abstract, but they're also right here. Like I'm sitting right here and I know which direction north, south, east, and west are, right? And it, as we begin our, our um, movement practices and participating in these spaces, we might start to pick up, oh, when I face south, it feels like this. When I face east, it feels like this. Or when I face, you know, south in the morning, it's one thing. When I face south in the evening, it's a different thing. We start to tune up a little bit. So um, that's all the information I wanted to share now. Um, we have some information about how Taiji tai and Qigong are um, similar and how they're different. I'd like everybody to be able to sort of explain these to somebody who is not uh, a TCM provider because these questions do come up, right? And uh, I'll post a couple other very short assignments um, and see you everyone on Thursday. So I appreciate everyone taking the time and I hope the rest of your week goes great. <laughs>